Another solution to the provision of public goods is for the government to provide them. It's well accepted that public spaces, parks, gardens, playgrounds enhance the quality of life for all. The government can choose to provide these goods, but how much should they provide? One of the problems about determining the optimal provision of a public good is knowing the value that people place upon those goods. One way of helping with that, according to some economists, is to say we can imply the price that people place on such goods by the way in which they behave in other markets. Here we are in Boulder, Colorado, and this house is on sale for $650,000. Similar houses, 30 miles away in Denver, are being sold for far less than that. So why are people paying so much more for houses here? The argument is, it's because they're buying public amenities. In this case, it's the provision of many lovely parks and so on, which simply aren't there in Denver. For other parts of the country, it might be because there are superior public libraries, superior police force and so on. The principle is that you look at two houses in different areas of the country that are selling for substantially different amounts of money and argue that the difference in the price reflects the higher provision of the public good. Similarly, one can expect to buy a lower crime rate by moving to areas with high police protection. Effectively, there's a market in police. Of course, others might prefer areas where the local tax is lower, but where there's less police protection. The idea here is called the tie-bout hypothesis, because effectively there exists a market for such public goods. But more often, the approach is the simple one. The government produces and provides the goods free at the point of use. But although it's simple, it's also problematic. There are two main problems with this approach. First, there's the problem valuing the public good. How much do consumers value the public good? when there isn't a price being charged for it. So it's difficult to know what the provision of the public good is worth and therefore what is its optimal provision. There's also the problem that revenue will be required to pay for its provision. But this requires taxation and taxation can, as we have seen earlier, misallocate resources in other markets. Most governments do not leave the provision of public goods to markets for the reasons we've explored. But how do they decide how much is the optimal quantity to provide if they're unconvinced by the tie-bout hypothesis? One way to decide the value consumers place upon a public good is via summing the individual demand curves to form a market demand curve similar to what we did for a private good. However, there's an important difference. Assume for simplicity there are just two consumers and each of their demand curves for this public good is shown as D1 and D2. When we sum them, we sum them vertically to give D tot, the total market demand curve. This is because consumers are not getting different amounts of the good as they would for a private good, but simultaneously they receive a collective value for the public good. Assuming a marginal cost of provision of MC, the optimal provision is the level of output at which MC equals D tot, where each consumer receives the same amount of the public good or service. Ideally, to maximize consumer welfare, consumer 1 would pay P1 for it, and consumer 2, P2. But there's no way that the government can discover directly the value placed by consumers on such public goods, so the problem remains. However, as we shall now see, there's a strong case for saying that some public goods are significantly undervalued.